Dollars in GCOMF. Awesome. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jules. Uh, last year I was part of the Angular team. This year I'm just their best friend. <laughs> but I'll always be part of the Angular community. So uh, this is the Angular team panel. It's always been my favorite part of ng-conf. And uh, this year we're going to take mostly live audience questions. So if you have a question, find Tara yeah. or Frosty over there. To get us started, I'm going to ask a question of Stephen that I've been asked about 10 times at the conference myself. Welcome back again, though. What was that? Welcome back. I'm always coming back. We love having you. You just here. can't get rid of me. Good. <laughs> so, Stephen, can you tell the audience why NG Ivy is called Ivy? Sure, sure. So, uh, Ivy Project. So, first of all, names don't matter, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's so clearly we, in DevRel. We, we tried picking a name that uh, intentionally didn't have a meaning, uh, even though I think internally to the team it actually did originally have a me uh, meaning. So uh, part of the origin story of it was that uh, we have a lot of really great open source contributors, uh, people that we include on the team from other companies. Uh, and one of these, these groups, the, the Amadeus group, Pavel, uh, Lucas and uh, a few others, uh, they've been working on some ideas around how we could do the rendering pipeline better, uh, and they actually had four instances of that, and so they were calling it Ivy. Uh, we, it's not the fourth one for us, it's actually the third renderer for us, and so we wanted to try and get rid of the number, uh, and so we went with Ivy, Ivy, Y. Uh, hopefully it doesn't confuse anyone, hopefully it doesn't have too much meaning, we just want it to be a name, because eventually it's going to disappear, right? It's going to just be Angular, uh, and we'll stop talking about Ivy. Frosty. We got, a, we got a question over here. You guys ready? So I'm an educator, or I, li I like to say that I'm helping people get into tech. And Angular, as Alyssa was mentioning, is big, and there's NPM, and there's Git, and there's version control, and there's, right, you go on and on. So my question is, to bring people into tech, especially front-end development, what, are, what do you recommend they start with to get to Angular? Because like JavaScript, you teach jQuery development, you teach all that stuff, and they're out, and they're now immediately behind, you know, they're behind. So what advice do you guys have for teaching brand new people, whether it's programs or, as myself, building material to help people? So Rob, why don't you take that question? Uh, that's a really good question. So I think one of the things that we like about Angular and we've tried to maintain with Angular is this basic idea that HTML is, is kind of the core of templating, right? And so I think for a lot of developers, HTML is a good place to start, getting a feel for kind of what it is and how to put it together. Um, I'll be honest though, like I learned Angular as I learned JavaScript as I learned HTML, right? And there's a lot of different opinions on this, but for me, one of the things that I like about Angular is that and I liked when I started back in the, you know, the very, very beginning of Angular for me, was I got immediate feedback and I was immediately successful, right? I was able to build stuff and that got me kind of sucked into actually wanting to continue to do programming, right? When you do a huge amount of tutorials, you learn like, you know, hello world, let's do an input box and all of these things, uh, it can get slow and you feel like you're not getting anywhere, right? And so certainly some HTML, some JavaScript maybe, but you know, it's, it's equally as fine to sort of jump right in and run our tutorial, right, and kind of learn on the fly. I'm sure other people have other opinions, but, you know, that's, that's where I came from. You want to talk? Okay. This question was asked in the RxJS panel about how to learn RxJS. And Ben had a really good uh, response, I thought, which was that he learned by just running up some RxJS, uh, like, mini demo, and then just playing with operators. And I think that um, things like Stackblitz provide a perfect way to do this. You just run up a Stackblitz and then just start mucking about with um, the HTML, the JavaScript. You see it immediately happening and you get that immediate feedback. And there's nothing better than doing hands on. Terry, you got a question out there? I got one over here in the middle. Cool, go. Hey, everyone, my name is Eric. Uh, this question is for Igor. Igor, this morning in the keynote, you mentioned Google applying the code of conduct, conduct to the broader community. Would you mind elaborating a bit on this? Sure. Um, when we started with Angular eight years ago, nine years ago, um, we were a very small team, and 
back then already we thought, you know, the only way we can build something as big as what Angular is today, and back then we had no idea how big it would be, uh, we knew that we needed help and we needed to get more people involved. So we started thinking about the community very early on, and it didn't take too long for us to, to post code of conduct um, and start looking for ways to make people aware of these things and help each other and whenever they see a problem, uh, interfere and, and stop and de-escalate any kind of issues. And over the years, I've seen numerous issues on GitHub uh, or just comment threads on Gitter where I was so proud to see the community or even um, Angular team members just jump in and de-escalate the situation and say, hey, uh, maybe you're not aware, uh, but you're being rude. Maybe you could rethink how you, how you uh, communicate with us. And in many cases, it helps. Uh, you would be amazed you know, if you just say, hey, this is not nice. Uh, that's enough to de-escalate many of these situations. But sometimes it's not. And that's when we as the Angular team get these escalations in from the community and we get involved and Steve and me and several other people usually look at these things and uh, reach out and try to help and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, is this a systemic problem? Uh, is, has this person been problematic for a long time? And if that's the case, then we reach out directly. We talk to them and see, hey, we see you being part of the Angular community, but you're not understanding our values. We really value uh, the welcoming community. It's very important for us. Uh, maybe you could rethink how you uh, interact. And there were cases where we had excellent technical contributors, uh, people who were making huge difference to Angular, contributing lots of changes, lots of improvements, and we had to ban them from all of the channels, stop uh, them from contributing, because even though they were technically super skilled, they were not being nice to everybody else on GitHub. They were very rude, and they were um, making the, pace, uh, the place very hostile. And for us, even though those technical contributions are very important, what is more important is that community that is building Angular feels safe and welcoming. So in those cases, we are willing to take uh, very harsh actions and exclude people from the community. Sometimes it's just temporary because uh, just giving a warning is enough. In other cases, um, there, there are people that are still banned and are not able to contribute or be part of events like this because of their past behavior. We have a question over here from Mike. Hi, uh, this is just more of a generic question. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to Angular 6 coming out, uh, and I know that it was mentioned that other packages are going to be updating their versions to 6. Uh, are we going to be, um, I guess, assuming that those other packages will be following the same sort of non-breaking every wait, waiting for the next version release, um, you know, going forward and Steven. Uh, okay, sorry, and, the, and then also that uh, are they going to follow the same sort of LTS sort of timeline that uh, was explained earlier on? Yeah, so we use semantic versioning for all of our packages, even those that, like uh, dev kit and things like that, some of the, the sub-dependencies that uh, we're not bringing up to six. So semantic versioning is kind of always how we do things. So when there's a major, that's where we can possibly have breaking changes. Minors, we're gonna add features. Patches, we're only gonna be doing bug fixes. So uh, we're bringing together the kind of, uh, I call them the core packages or the framework packages. So at Angular, core, common, compiler, platform browser, platform browser, dynamic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all those are going to be six. Angular Material is going to be v6, as well as the Angular CLI. Um, and the, the LTS promise that we're, we're making is kind of extends to all of these things, because it's really, we want you to make the decision to use Angular and then not have to worry as much about the, the version numbers. So I, I will make a, a small comment on that. So uh, we're not promising that version four or version six of the CLI is going to necessarily work with version eight. Uh, of Angular, right? The idea is you move these things together, um, although we do have an N plus two for any libraries. Cool. Uh, and also, just to make sure that we're disambiguating this a little bit, RxJS hap just happens to be at version six. It's, <laughs> it's serendipity that it's at ver version six at the same time, so uh, it might not always remain in lockstep, because it could get, it could get to the point where uh, there aren't many more breaking changes left to make to RX, RxJS, so it goes a much longer time without you know, updating the version. But just, just to make that sure that's clear. 
We have a question over here from Sean. When uh, version 6 comes out, what does that mean for the version 4 LTS? When can we expect that to stop being supported? No, uh, when we announced the LTS support for version 4, we said that um, the active part of the support would stop uh, when we ship V5. And LTS for version 4 would remain for the next major, uh, two major cycles. So you have uh, LTS support for version 4 until we release version 7. So six more months. So effectively, the, the way I'd summarize that is 18 months from release. So we, we do six months of active development on every major. Um, and then after that, it's 12 months. So from September 2016, or whenever, when did version 4 come out? It was March, right? March of 17. So you have 18 months from March of 2017 for version 4. Uh, and I think we even just did a, a one of the first, uh, we're working on one of the first bug fixes back to version 4. Yeah, there, there was a security enhancement, not a critical patch, but we still f felt like it was security related. So uh, we cherry picked it and released uh, LTS version just last week, I think, recently. Frosty. All right, we got a question over here from Jacob. Hi, um, I know we are giving a lot of emphasis on testing, right? Quick question, love snapshot testing. Are we planning to bring that home? Supporting snapshot testing in testbed. Uh, uh, we don't have any plans for that, uh, but uh, if you want to contribute, we are open to take it. Uh, we have a question over here from Gerard. Over here. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, can't really wait for version six, but there's a last uh, GitHub comment somewhere talking about in version seven that the ng module might not be necessary anymore. Um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit about that? Thank you, uh, Igor. <laughs> I, I can try. So um, I've been trying to get rid of ng modules for as long as I remember. But in a way, that would not be painful to anybody. Um, and with IV, we finally have uh, the building blocks that will allow us to do that. So we'll see. I'm not promising this will happen in v7. Um, first goal for us is to get IV to be fully backwards compatible before we start even uh, adding any kind of new features that IV enables uh, and release that. So that, that's um, what we are trying to do before we even get to these things. But yeah, uh, we're discussing this. Uh, we feel like there are situations, especially when you're using elements where engine modules are just unnecessary complication. Uh, and in those cases, you should be able to build Angular components without engine modules. Igor, Igor. It's, it's fair to say that there, I'm over here to your right. Hello. <laughs> Is it fair to say that they're optional rather than we're getting rid of them? Yes. You didn't raise your hand. Rob. Sorry, you didn't, you didn't call my name out when I got on stage, though, so. Uh, we have a question from Joel. Hi, I was just curious, uh, with the rate at which, you know, all this stuff changes, in combination with you guys, you know, traveling and submitting blogs and, you know, videos and all that, how do you guys balance between family and work and extracurricular activities and all that without feeling completely overwhelmed? Wow, that's a rough question. <laughs> um. <laughs> Do we look like we are not overwhelmed? <laughs> I mean, I, I will say I think one of the things that we're trying to do um, is make sure that the, the engineering team spends time on the engineering so they, they can go back to their families, et cetera. I mean, it, it's, if you went to every Angular conference now at this point, you, you would never write another line of code. because. There are amazing Angular conferences all over the world. I think the, the, the anecdotal number I keep throwing out, which I don't have any scientific backing, backing is uh, I think the number of Angular conferences has tripled in the last year. And so we, we are not going to be going to all of those. I apologize. You, you can still ask us to. Uh, let me know. <laughs> we want to know about these great conferences, uh, but we can't always support them directly. But we can ask our GDEs support them around the world. Ooh. GDs. Yes. GDEs, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, these people have all gone through an interview process, a certification process, uh, that they are experts in Angular. They travel all the time, they speak, they blog, they write content. Uh, we want to really empower these people to be representatives of Angular across the world. So 
if you're if you're running a conference and you want to make sure that the team gets home to their families, maybe reach out to a GDE instead. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe to get back to the question, uh, anyone have anything that they try to do in their daily life to keep some work-life balance? I can mention something that the Angular team has done as, as a team. We have a yoga room. I don't even work there anymore, but it's so recent that I still feel like I do. And I visit the yoga room, but we have a yoga room, so sometimes at lunch we get together and do yoga and meditate. Um, there's a running club. What else do you guys do? Board games. Um, board games. There's lots of runners, as you mentioned, so we often go running together or go hiking. Um, yeah. Pull request. <laughs> uh, it, it might sound a little bit silly, but one of the things that uh, comes as part of your Google training uh, is this thing that they, they've cleverly branded G-Pause, which is literally just take a moment, breathe, reflect, be present, and then kind of move on. So, hey, should we do it together? Sure. No? Should we do it? All right. Do a G pause. So just, this is a, a very, very short NG pause. There you go, whoever said that. It's genius. Just breathe. It's going to be OK. <laughs> It'll feel better. Another good suggestion that Brad Green had for me personally, and I think for a few other members of the team, is an app called Headspace. Yeah. yeah. So using Headspace can really help you keep you know, centered so when you find yourself working at 2 o'clock in the morning five days a week, I'm looking at you, Igor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You might change your attitude about it. Another good work-life balance thing is to just leave. <laughs> it's like at the end of the day, you leave, you go home. That doesn't... I, I also have a recommendation. If you work from home, you don't have a commute, so that's a lot of free time. <laughs> Bicycle to work. Yeah, but um, like I just circle back to my house. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we have another question in the audience? Yeah, I can't have, see Frosty. We have one from uh, John over here. So, I actually have like two questions. Uh, first question, mostly about the conference. Uh, what I noticed that uh, uh, the team really worked hard for putting this conference together. So, I appreciate uh, their hard work, but I see like uh, most of the talk in general for people from Angular team, definitely they are very uh, best in the Angular world, but there are millions of people using Angular. Uh, they might not be working on the latest things, what's coming, and the next and next things, but they're solving Angular uh, or using Angular to solve their problem, might not be shiny things coming next on your corner. Uh, so I feel like there is a less, uh, representation from that uh, wide, uh, big audience group. Uh, maybe they might not have like that uh, good, um, uh, good uh, talk submitted. Uh, there could be some extra effort, or is there any guideline to uh, take the real stories out there where people solve their problem uh, in parallel to what's coming, the shiny corner from the, uh, uh, all the package manager, or all the Angular team, uh, Google team. That's question one. And oh, this. <laughs> Here, but maybe, maybe we should. Steven. I knew there was a question in there somewhere. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll try and answer that question first before moving on to the next question. So um, there, there's a couple things. So uh, one thing that to note is actually we don't put on ng-conf. The Angular team, uh, we are not the hosts. We we are invited to come speak, and so we, we're very lucky. So actually, a huge thank you to the ng-conf organizing team. <laughs> they, they do a ton of work to get the speakers here to make sure that the, there's a really great content. They do surveys to try and connect all the uh, content to what people hear about. So uh, uh, maybe if, if they want to re respond to that first part of the question. Um, the second part that I'll, I'll mention very briefly um, is all about th this idea that we Oh, I'm blanking. What was the second part of the question? It was about um, if we were going to show a success oh, story. success story. So uh, that's something that we're really trying to do a lot better. Um, so I don't know. We just did a blog post last week from Charter, who uh, they had a great story about how they, they were designing component libraries and things like that. And so uh, if you have those stories, uh, let us know. Let me know. We, we would love to highlight those. Because a lot of, like, so we, we always say that 90% of Angular apps are behind the firewall, kind of developed in secret. Like, my company is building the coolest thing in the universe, and I can't tell anyone. You, you can. Let us know, and we, we can help you tell these stories, and we can help your developers everywhere. 
Does Tara have Were a question? Were you going to do the second part? Okay. Go we ahead. have a question from Julia over here. Hi, I have a question about uh, future of jo uh, zone JS and change detection in Angular. I heard a lot of great plans about other areas and nothing about zone and change detection, and I feel that it's extremely important for performance. So I want to know, I, are you happy with zone and current change detection, or you're planning to do something in the future? Thank you. Rob. So um, the answer to that is kind of both, right? Uh, I think one of the things we did in V5 was zones became optional. Uh, they work pretty well for most people, but certainly there are cases that we run into where they don't work so well. And one of those cases, for example, is elements, right? And so in V5, we made zones optional so that people could begin to experiment with, you know, where we're gonna go with zones so you can pull them out. The reason we have them is to know when to run change detection, right? Um, so I think that we, we will keep them around as long as we need them. If there becomes a better solution, we will do that. Uh, there is an effort, obviously there's this big kind of reactive push on Angular, right? And so there's some, some opportunities there to, uh, you know, to maybe change the way we do change detection. Maybe you don't need zones if you're doing things in a push kind of way. Um, and the new IV architecture opened up, uh, opens up some new options as well. So kind of the long and short of this is that you'll be able to continue to use them as long as you need to, but uh, we are certainly investigating different avenues, different ways of doing it, different paradigms for this kind of thing. Uh, because you know, users have different use cases. Certain people who are building you know, enterprise apps have very, very different needs than people who are building you know, stock ticker apps that are doing you know, thousands of ticks per second. So we wanna give people the, the flexibility to you know, do the easy button, which is what zones do, and if you want to, then you know, take very, very low level control of Angular and do what you need to do. Okay, we got a question from Delvin over here. I work with a small team, um, and one of the concerns we have is the pace at which Angular is evolving, Angular is changing. And this is a great thing because I believe the team is adding some significant um, features to the platform. But my concern is breaking changes. I'm so happy that you presented on NG update and that this will help to to minimize the amount of manual changes and manual edits that we have to make to our code. Um, I'm wondering, uh, m moving forward, are uh, the future releases are uh, going to have a significant um, impact on the, the amount of changes that we have to make to our code? Igor? Steven, either one of you probably. Sure. I, I can pick this one. So. I think this is a good question because I hear from lots of people that they fear that our release cycle is a little too uh, fast for for their company. Um, when when we decide when we decided on uh, two major releases per year, uh, we did it because we looked at what Android was doing, what what Chrome was doing, and those were two extremes. Uh, Chrome releases every three months. Android and iOS they release once a year. On web, everything changes pretty much every month. Uh, so in order for us to stay relevant, stay with the pace of uh, web, uh, we thought that six months were the right uh, cycle for, for, for Angular. But having said that, we understand how painful breaking changes are. And even for us, because um, my team, uh, Angular team, supports all of the applications at Google. There is currently about 600 applications um, that use Angular at Google. And whenever we make a break and change, it's my team that is responsible for updating those applications. This forces us not to make big break and changes because we would go crazy. Um, and it's good for everybody because it means that there is a sense of stability, there is a sense, um, but at the same time, a sense of evolution. So we are making big changes. IV is a big change, but the way we are building it is backwards compatible because otherwise we would not be able to release it. So even though we are releasing quite frequently, uh, I would say that the number of significant breaking break changes between version two and six is minimal. I, I can't even think of anything that would affect every single application uh, right now. So most of the breaking changes were just corner cases and things that would affect uh, a small portion of, of Angular developers. And whenever we make these changes, the first thought is, like, can we first deprecate the API? Can we warn the developers not to use this? Can we provide tooling? Uh, material design team, uh, they, they did an excellent job when they went through 
a very big transition from MD dash prefix to mat prefix, they released a tool that would update all of the applications. And we build these tools because we need them for ourselves in order to update all of the applications of Google. Uh, RxJS is the same. Um, we, we invested a lot of time into backwards compatibility for RxJS v6. We build tooling that refactors all of the applications from version 5 to 6. And we use these things at Google to update all of the applications. So I wouldn't be worried about the breaking changes. I know that the, it looks scary on the paper. But what we hear from developers around the world is that the updates are actually pretty smooth. Uh, and they feel very confident in, in updating. And it's not a big deal. And I, I think the creation of ng update really is, is kind of being baked into our mindset as well. So now that we have this, this kind of centralized way of applying these transforms to your code base as part of the update process, um, we're going to be thinking that way when we start designing these breaking changes. Because if you can design them in a way that we can tool them, that, that's going to be better for developers. And uh, our, our really big hope and our, our big bet is that the community is going to do the same thing. So that if you have to push breaking changes into your package, being able to take advantage of something like ng-update and schematics under the hood, you can help your developers stay up to date as well. We have a question over here. Oh, nope. OK, nope. from Srikant. Hey, hi, uh, I'm Srikant. Um, so uh, my question is regarding online courses. A lot of you guys, I'm sure you guys have a lot of online courses, which is great. But most of these are paid contents or like in a pro version of it, which we have to pay for it. Uh, does Google or Angular team has any plans uh, or a roadmap to make these online contents uh, available for free? Uh, reason is like you know there will be more users and there will be like you know uh, if I mean I'm sure there are a lot of YouTube courses but they're not that professional as you guys are. So um, no offense. Um, so um, so do you have any plans to make these uh, online courses for free uh, as a Angular team? I, I think we, we always want to make Angular I.O. our central spot for factual information about Angular, getting started, guides, tutorials, techniques, those sorts of things. Um, I, I don't think we'll ever be able to or want to replace the, the amazing content that the community, a lot of it's free, a lot of it's paid. Um, we, we can't replace them because they're bringing something different than what we bring, right? They're bringing a context uh, that if you find a course that matches your, your situation, your context, it, you're going to be much better at learning from them than you could for us, because we fundamentally can't address every context that a developer is coming from. And so a lot of our content is going to necessarily have to be more general. Um, so I, I think we, we want to do better. Uh, I think we'd love to do videos if we could find the time to, to make more videos. Uh, but we, we really rely on the community, because uh, you, you said that we're better at Angular than them. Maybe not. <laughs> In terms of building, we're really great at building Angular, right? But we have amazing people on the community that are great at building applications, solving problems for, for developers, solving problems for businesses uh, in ways that we can't do. OK, we got a question back here from Yarov. Hi. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the other Google services that already scale in Google themselves. Uh, for instance, the Google Maps API you can display almost half a billion pins uh, on, on the map itself and it still scales and it's still responsive. My question is, if we want to use Google Maps API with Angular, how much Angular adds overhead on top of that? Like, if you can answer in, uh, in seconds, for instance. Like, how, how many seconds does Angular adds on top of the native uh, JavaScript or the plain JavaScript uh, Google Maps API? That's my first question. I have a second question, but I'll... Rob, I think you're the right. Uh, so I think if you're using like the, the Google Maps WebGL API, Angular is going to add little to no overhead, right? Um, the, the, the Google Maps kind of API and uh, like kind of map drop-in widgets are, are fairly self-contained, right? And so Angular can talk to them and say, you know, add a thing or remove a thing. But I, I, I can't think of, of any specific overhead Angular is going to add other than obviously what Angular costs already, right? Um, but I don't think there's going to be any sort of detrimental interactions between them. Like Angular isn't getting into the you know the Google Mapping sort of plugin or anything like that. So I, minimal impact, if if any, I think is the answer to that question. And um, we have a question from Ian up here. Um, I know you're not quite done yet, but I was wondering what's next for you guys. But instead of listing everything, what would you be excited that you're going to be working on next? Uh, I'm most excited about taking elements and taking Ivy and putting them together, because I think that's going to be a very, very exciting, very, very useful piece of tech. Alex Eagle, what are you excited about? 
I'm excited about build tooling. Um, I'm excited about uh, getting, getting, the, getting to the point where uh, our internal build tools are sufficiently similar to the build tools that you're using that we can, um, we can share support and documentation and so on between them. Um, but that's still under Angular Labs, and it's going to be a while before we have. Um, uh, I mean, Ang Angular Labs is where we do our our big bets, the things that are things that are uh, still more than one release out. Um, so I'm not going to give any dates, but you weren't asking that. <laughs> uh, one thing I'm excited about is uh, also streamlining our community contribution process, so we can accept and uh, better process contributions from the Angular community. So stay tuned. Rocky, were you trying to say something down there? Uh, sure, I'll mention it. Um, library support from the CLI. Um, as of right now, building libraries for Angular has been done through the community um, through a few different um, uh, packages that are out there. Um, so bringing that support into the CLI to be able to build libraries with the CLI is one thing I'm really excited to get out with six. What? Uh, one thing that I haven't heard yet, um, it's uh, ng add and ng update uh, are for me like what I'm most excited about in the future. And I'm not talking about like the next 6.0 release, I'm talking about like maybe a year or two down the road. ng add and ng update will enable a lot of libraries to do, uh, to help users and developers like really enhance their application in ways that we probably don't even think about right now. but. Really, like these basic these basic blocks that will enable a lot of uh, crazy use cases that I'm sure will be super awesome. Hey, Kara, what are you most excited about? <laughs> um, I feel like this is so obvious, but I'm really excited about finishing up Ivy and um, making things smaller and faster. So that's, that's it. <laughs> uh, I'm. I'm really excited about how um, Angular is having a big focus on making stuff tree shakeable and how that's becoming like a, a known concept and very familiar thing about uh, like in the community. So that's cool because once you get more libraries being tree shakeable and libraries being built in a way that means that they can be tree shaked, you get like a lot of gains. You get like a, it's not just this library that's tree shakeable. It's like this library uses another, and since this one is tree shakeable, you don't use that. So I'm really excited about how in the next what year people get more aware of that. Uh, the tooling gets better at identifying those things, and like we get, I don't know, maybe like a 50% gain out of nowhere that we didn't have right now because a big part of the community is aware of that, and I think that's amazing. So lastly, uh, Tina or Jeremy, can one of the two of you tell us what's most exciting in Angular material? Uh, so I mentioned some of this in my talk. Uh, I'm actually most excited about the additions we're going to be making to the CDK uh, because, like, well, Angular material, Angular material is really great. We know a lot of people aren't able to commit to that material design aesthetic or they want to do something else. And so being able to provide tooling for people to build their own components without having to reinvent a lot of stuff is really valuable. And coming up soon, we have drag and drop. Uh, and virtual scrolling is going to be what we're mostly working on after 6.0. Cool. So I think that's our time for our panel. Thanks to the Angular team for showing up and answering everybody's questions. And I'm going to hang it over to Frosty. And thanks to, thanks to Jules for coming back. And being part of this, this event with us. OK. So here's a fact. I love this team. Um, I need everyone to get it loud and say thanks to these guys. So. We just spent three days listening to um, likely the best group of speakers we've ever had. So um, everyone show thanks to the speakers too, please. <laughs> so together with, with the Angular team and the speakers, this event can't happen without 
an amazing group of sponsors. So I need another thanks for the sponsors as well, please. I also want a round of applause for Sunny and her whole entire staff, the AngieCom staff. They're fantastic. Without them, our home away from home here wouldn't exist. So a serious thanks to Sunny and her team. Um, I'm gonna give a huge thanks to Tara who was, she was our MC this year. She helped pick talks, um, which was crazy. And that was the first thing we had her do. Uh, she worked with us on the code of conduct and she's been fantastic to work with. So thank you, Tara. I wanna say, I, I give a huge thanks to Bonnie, Kip and Joe Eames for for organizing this event and for all the effort they put in. It literally takes 12 months to ideate and ideate and re-ideate over so many things to get an event this electric. So big round of applause for the NGCOM team as well. And then lastly, I want everyone who's, who's been applauded for to clap for the, for the attendees and for the community that's worldwide because this event has been amazing and we couldn't have done it without everyone here, so. Okay, so that's a, that's a wrap on NGCOM 2018. We'll see everybody in 2019, thank you. Let's hear it for Hold Frosty on. too. Hold on, Igor wants to say something. Can we clap for one group of people? Um, people that are not here with us. Um, there is part of Angular team that was not able to join us because they're finishing things. There are people in Europe that are big contributors that are part of the community that were not able to join us. So I think we should keep in mind all those peoples. Um, please clap. Show your thanks. <laughs> all right, that's a wrap. We'll see everybody in 2016. Thank you.